to, well, I, I, I guess I can't really say welcome to the Frankie Sloppy Show since you've been listening already uh, uh, for the whole night, and I appreciate the uh, people tuning in and whatnot. Uh, and as promised, I was finally able to get uh, a chance to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with the guy who I'm interviewing right now. Uh, you might know him from uh, Halloween 2 as Michael Myers, or you might know him from uh, other, uh, stunt or, or other films that he's done uh, or as a famous world famous uh, Hollywood stunt double, none other than the living legend, Dick Warlock. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Frankie, a living legend. Well, I don't look at myself like a living legend, I'll tell you that. Uh, in fact, at my age, I'm just barely living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we all, we all get a little older through, through time, but, uh, I mean, I'm sure uh, you're, you'll be in the uh, Hollywood uh, Hall of Fame here sometime soon, or maybe you are already involved with that. I'm not really sure. I, I didn't, don't even know about a Hollywood Hall of Fame that would incorporate stunt guys into it. I know there's one uh, uh, in one of the Midwest states. I don't know whether it's Montana or Wyoming or somewhere in there. Yeah. That, uh, a fellow named John Carpenter, and, and not any relation to the director John Carpenter, yeah. but uh, he has a, a stuntman's Hall of Fame, if that's what you're referring to. Okay, yeah, maybe something like that. I, I was not aware that they had a Hollywood stuntman Hall of Fame. I just, uh, I just figured, you know, people uh, eventually get to a Hall of Fame of something of what they've been good at. So. Uh, no, I, as far as I know, there's no Hollywood uh, Hall of Fame, you know, in Hollywood itself. And in fact, the uh, the stunt community recently campaigned with the Screen Actors Guild, or not just the Screen Actors Guild, it's the, the Motion Picture Academy, about having uh, Academy Awards for stunt people. Okay. And uh, they, they turned them down and they says, no, nope. uh, we, we, you know, we give it for hairdressers and stuff like that, but we don't want to give it to, uh, to stunt guys. So, I don't know, I and mean, we probably never will. Uh, are you, uh, like, if, if someone were to go to, like, the Hollywood, California, and uh, see you, would you, would they be able to see your steps or footprints on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at all, or? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, there's, it's a, that's a funny deal. You have to be sponsored for that. You have to pay $3,000, and then the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce for the city of Hollywood votes on whether or not to accept you for a, for a star. Okay. Uh, and I don't know of any stuntmen who have a star there, uh, not even Yakima Kanat, who's the granddaddy of uh, all the stunt guys, you know. I don't know, you know, what the age... Uh, uh, the demographic is for your station there. Okay. But, uh, uh, for for those of you guys out there that, that don't know, Yakima Canut is a uh, a stunt guy who started out with John Wayne years and years ago and kind of paved the way for the stunt community. Okay. And, uh, he's the only one I know of that's ever received an Academy Award, and that was for a lifetime achievement. Well, then maybe that's something that you might be able to get one day. <laughs> Who knows? It's hard to say. I doubt that. that. I'll tell you my, what, how I feel about myself as a stunt person. Okay. Uh, there, are, there are stars in the acting world, and then there are supporting players. And I've always considered myself a supporting player. I've never been a star stunt guy like, like a Hal Needham or a Dar Robinson, uh, although my body of work is probably as big or bigger than theirs. But I've never considered myself as a star stunt guy, just a, a supporting player. Okay, and that, and that, that kind of sums it up kind of right there. And uh, uh, now, uh, going with that, uh, uh, what kind of got you into acting or stunt in the first place? Well, actually, <clears throat> uh, I've always wanted to be in the business, and I wanted primarily to be in the stunt community. But uh, I also had a longing to be an actor. But that never panned out because once I got the opportunity to act, I found out I couldn't. <laughs> I developed stage fright. Okay. Uh, when I was about 17, a guy forced me to get up on a stage and sing, and I got out of meter with the, with the band, and I'd never sung with a band before, never even rehearsed with these guys, and it gave me a terrible case of stage fright. So I'm better off doing stunts where I don't have to talk too much. Or like Michael Myers. He never says a word, just kind of pops around and, you know, does people in. <laughs> and kills people as well. <laughs> but you don't do that. You don't kill people. No. Uh, like the character, of course. But, uh, uh, okay, and uh, you told me earlier uh, before we uh, recorded this interview that you've been a stunt double for about 43 years, about, huh? Yeah, about 43 years. I started in 1960, and uh, uh, my last film, 
I think it was 2003. I think it was Spider-Man was the last and movie that I worked on. And what were uh, what was your role in that as the stunt double? Well, <coughs> on uh, if, if anyone has seen the movie, remembers the balcony scene where they had all these gray-headed guys, and, you know, the chief of police and the chief of fire and all these politicians. They were all on this balcony, and the Green Goblin comes in and throws a bomb. Uh, you know, blowing up that part yeah. of the building and, the, and a piece of the uh, balcony fell or, or, or slanted down and the yeah. actor slid down to the edge and here comes uh, Spider-Man and saves the day. Well, I was one of those red-headed guys that was up on the balcony. Uh, it wasn't a big deal, but it was a gift to me. Uh, it was a week's work. And uh, like I say, it was my last movie and, and I'm proud of it. Uh, yeah, and now that it's, it's all come back to me, uh, I, I do have to know the first Spider-Man movie on DVD, and uh, yeah, I remember that scene. So you were involved with that. That was your very last film, too mm -hmm. late. And is, are there any other uh, future projects coming up or that you might be wanting to do, or is that kind of your is that kind of your last hurrah for that? You know what I'd like to do, and I think it'd be fun, uh, is to do some kind of a cameo in the next Halloween movie. You know, as a storekeeper that Michael Myers steals the next mask from, or uh, something, <laughs> just just for just for a kick. But I don't think it'll it'll ever happen. I I don't know a thing about Rob Zombie, who I understand is going to direct the next one. Uh, I think Brad Marie is a great guy, and I thought he did a great job as Michael in the in the one that he did. Uh, I, as far as I know, he's supposed to reprieve the role and do it again. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, they get a little flaky down there with the with the company that's doing these things. So I don't know what will ever happen. I I don't know if Rob Zombie's ever even heard my name. So uh, anyway, I'd love to do a little part in that one. Okay, uh, maybe uh, uh, Rob Zombie, of course. You know, if if you say you're not familiar, he's a he's a musician, of course, and uh, more of a kind of like a Alice Cooper kind of type of deal, kind of, you know, with music, uh, kind of like Gap or whatever, and his music kind of, kind of what like Marilyn Manson does, and that's what he kind of, if you've ever seen uh, The House of a Thousand Corpses, uh, that was one of his first movies he ever uh, made or whatnot. Uh, was that with Sid Egg? Uh, I believe so. That's the guy who plays with the clown or whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd, okay. be, that'd be right. So if you have any idea, that's yeah, kind, of, kind of where, uh, how that kind of uh, got started or whatnot. He, uh, that was his first film he ever directed. So, uh, I I personally have not seen the whole thing. I just you know kind of give you a little upset what who he is or whatnot. But uh, okay, uh, now to you, uh, uh, what are your memories? Now we're gonna go way back, way back to when you first started, way even before Michael Myers, way before Halloween two, way even before Flash. You know, because I, I knew you did it. You were in that film as well, with Chevy Chase. Uh, uh, a couple of the Fletch films. Yeah, Fletch One and Fletch Lives, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what were your memories from your very first film? The very, very first, first film? Yeah, the very first one you ever did. Okay, it was a, it was a picture called Ballad of a Gunfighter with Marty Robbins, the country western singer who did the song El Paso. Yep. And I gotta tell you, being on the set with this gentleman, and I say gentleman because he truly was, was a real treat. Almost every lunch with that, that he was on the set, he would during what was supposed to be his lunch period, you know, he would sit around with his guitar and entertain us with all of his his multitude of songs that he he did, and and was just a, I don't know, he's just a, a great guy, and and of course my very first movie, uh, my doctor in fact had to front me the money. It was well. Not my doctor was the pediatrician that delivered two of my kids. They had to front me the money to get into the Screen Actors Guild because I didn't have the money. <laughs> so, and then and just you know going to the premiere at uh, the Cornell Theater in Burbank, California, and uh, having my friends and family there. Uh, the whole thing was, I mean, it was like just surreal. Uh, they didn't use that expression back then, but it was. Now that I think back on it. Uh, I, I, I couldn't think of a, of a happier time in my life as to have a dream come true. I mean, when you start out about nine or ten years old wanting to be in the movie business and then it finally comes true ten years later, uh, that's quite a trip, you know? Sure. And uh, with, with that, uh, how, how were you, uh, like, what kind of got you into uh, 
Oh, I guess I already asked you asked what, what got you into acting, but kind of what got you into like stunt double like like uh, why would you not be interested in like being an actor or whatnot? Or okay, when when it first started, uh, there was a television series on TV with an actor named Dick Jones who played uh, did the voice of Pinocchio, and he was a child star. And at this point. Uh, he was in a television series called The Range Rider, which was him and Jock Mahoney. And it was a western. And I looked like Dickie, and I wanted to double him. So I started writing letters to Flying A Studios, which was owned by Gene Autry, Gene Autry Productions. And, uh, of course, I never got any answers back because I was just a kid. I think I was 13 or 14 at the time I started writing these letters. And I, but I never lost the desire to do that. And, and uh, later on, I started skating in, in amateur roller derby and uh, doing that kind of stuff. And, and then I started working at a place called Corganville out in California, California. Uh, it was a movie ranch owned by Ray Crash Corrigan. And we used to do live shows in front of uh, 3,000 people on the weekends, you know doing these western things to go and try to do okay corral and uh, all like that and through that I met the guy that uh, wrote, produced and directed Ballad of a Gunfighter with Marty Robbins so I got to I got to be in that and play a part and then through that I met Walt Disney later on and then I became Kurt Russell's stunt double and uh, like I say uh, the dialogue didn't come easy because it was at Corrigan but I developed this stage fright, so I never really wanted to, I mean, sure, you'd like to act, but uh, the fear of it, so okay. I just never did, and uh, just went on into doing stunts, and when I got into Kurt Russell's contract, I stayed with him for 25 years. <laughs> and, and that's the next question I'm going to ask you, as we kind of segue into one question to another, uh, you were, uh, of course, uh, Kurt Russell's stunt double for over 25 years, and how does it feel to be a part of so many great films that you've done? and that you were able to help him out with. Well, you have to know Kurt to know what a, what a treat and a pleasure it was to be around him and, and work with him. Uh, he's just, he's one of the nicest gentlemen that I've known, in, you know, in the business. Uh, his dad is, is actually the one that got me into his contract because he told Kurt, he said, you know, when we were still at Disney doing the Dexter Riley things, he said, you know, we can't, at home tell when it's you and Will and Stick. He said, you ought to get, put him in the contract. And Kurt was a young kid at that point. I think he might have been 20. He was 18 when I first brought him 17. He celebrated his, his 18th birthday on, on our first movie together, which was Computer War Tennis Shoes. And his dad uh, said, well, you got to get him in the contract. Kurt said, I don't know how to do that. So he, he got it done. He talked to the agent, had me click it here. So whenever they hired him, they called me. And, um, I mean, he did some real good films, I think. Uh, I only missed a couple. I missed one that I really wanted to work on, and that was Elvis, because I'm a big Elvis fan. You know, and I thought he did a marvelous job in Elvis. And then there was another one with Henry Fonda that uh, they shot in Georgia and all the... He, he did something like roll under a train or something from one side of the tracks to the other. Yeah. Other than that, I did everything he did. Okay. From uh, Escape to New York to... I suppose you were in Overboard as well? No, that was another one that I gave away. I was working, I think, I was working on the thing at the time with, okay. with Carpenter uh, when they did that. And, uh, of course, they called me about doing it. And when I couldn't, then I, I stuck another guy in there who used to be Michael Landon's double, okay. named Hal Burton. Okay. And he was a pretty good double for Kurt, too, but he didn't really do anything for Kurt. He was just there. Kurt did everything himself. Okay, well, well that's excellent. And uh, uh, we also uh, talked about uh, Kurt Russell's first uh, film, uh, Elvis, and uh, uh, he said you, you you would love to be in that part or be in that film, but uh, why were you unable to uh, be in that film? Well, when, I, when he called me about it, and it was after the fact, you know, after he'd already shot the film, and I said, boy, I'd love to have done that. And he said, well, I'll tell you why you didn't. He said, there wasn't a thing in it. <laughs> and, and But I said, well, I saw Aaron Norris's name in there as your stunt double. And he said, yeah, they broke that in when we were in Memphis. He said, all he did was drive the car down the road, and they listed him as a store coordinator or something. 
And um, so anyway, Aaron Norris happens to be Chuck Norris's brother. Okay. You know, Chuck Norris I went to school with. I guess I went to school with both of them, uh, high school. Anyway, uh, and so I didn't get to do it. Okay. And uh, was he a good person to work with? Who is this? Kirk Russell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great guy. He would, he would always ask me, well, can I do this or do you want to do it? And he, i got to tell you about Kirk. There isn't anything that he couldn't do and do it better than me. <laughs> very physical guy, very handy. Uh, but, of course, you know the insurance problem. A producer can't afford to get his actor hurt. He can afford to get stunt people hurt because they just put the clothes on somebody else and do it again. You know what I'm saying? But uh, they can't afford to get their star hurt. There's a lot of actors out there that are very capable of doing it, most of the stuff we do. But it's uh, it's an insurance thing. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Uh, uh, with uh, with that, uh, now we go from that to uh, uh, your uh, role in Halloween 2. And I'm sure you got stories upon stories upon stories of uh, that film. And uh, first of all, first question I'm going to ask you about that. How were you able to be in that role, first of all? Okay, that, that's a pretty common knowledge, but uh, I, had, I had worked on the, let's see, Escape from New York yeah. with Deborah Hill and John Carpenter. And when we finished that, Deborah gave me a call and said, listen, can you come in and, and have a meeting uh, with me? She said, we're doing a, a new little picture. Uh, she didn't tell me what it was or, or anything. Uh, and she said, uh, I'd like you to be the stunt coordinator. So I said, sure. So I went into the office, I met with her, and she said, you, know, you have to go back and meet with the director, Rick Rosenthal. I said, fine, where is he? And she said, he's down at the end of the hall. So I head off down the hall, down the end of the hall, and on the way, there was an office that didn't have anything in it but a desk and a chair. Well, laying on the desk was the mask. <laughs> so I put the mask on, because by this time she had briefed me on what the movie was, yeah. but I had never seen the first one. So anyway, I put the mask on, and I go to his door, and I just stand there and look at him. And he says, who are you? I didn't answer. I just said, I stood there. He says, who the are you? I pulled the thing off. I said, well, I'm Dick Warlock, and I'm here about the coordinator job, blah, blah, blah. We had our little meeting. And as I was leaving, carrying the mask with me, I turned around and said to him, I said, is there any reason I can't play this guy? And he looked me up and down. And of course, I'm, I'm shorter than... than uh, the castle. Yeah. Of course, I'm shorter than anybody who's played him since then. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he looked me up and down. He said, no, I don't care if Deborah doesn't care. So I went back and asked her, and she said, no, it's okay with me. So that's how I got to, to play the part of Michael. Okay. And uh, See, Nick Castle yeah. is a writer-director. Uh, I don't think he had directed at that point, but that was his aspirations. He and John Carpenter went to film school together. So that's how Nick got credit. He was one of five different people who played Michael in the first one. Okay. Because the first one was a non-union movie. Yeah. So uh, anybody could have played him. You know, I mean, you could have got 20 people to do it, and they, it, it was just one of those things, you know. They'd say, okay, you put the, put the clothes on, we're going to do this scene. And that's, uh, that's how they made that first one. But the second one was a union film, so they used me all the way through. Okay, and uh, any... Uh because uh, I'll be honest, I have not seen that movie. Well, I actually have never seen it in full. I've just uh, seen bits and pieces of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Any well-known people that may have been in that film that people might have recognized from that film other than yourself? Oh, Donald Pleasance was uh, was highly recognizable, you know, and, and a great guy, you know. Pam uh, Shoup, she played Nurse Karen. She was, she was a recognizable uh, actress. I'm not sure. Lance Guest, who went on to, you know, be a, pretty much a household name, he yeah. was in that. I think that might have been one of his first projects. Uh, who else? Uh, I think Charlie was, Cyphers, who played the sheriff. He was, uh, he was well, pretty well known, you know. And he had worked for John Carpenter in several films. I think he worked in, in The Fog. And uh, uh, he might have even been in uh, Precinct, Assault on Precinct 13, the original one. Okay. And uh, I believe your son, Lance, was in that too, right? Well, both my boys were in that. Okay. Billy, who, who's, who went on to, you know, have an acting career, uh, he's been acting since he was 18 or so. But, uh, yeah, he was, in, he was in that with me. He uh, played a little, there were two young boys that ran up in front of the Myers house when Loomis and the, the deputy sheriff were out there. And they were, they started asking about, uh, Bennett Tramer and this funny mask he was wearing. 
and he was that character. And then Lance was the boombox boy. Yeah. He uh, had the he had the boombox boy. I mean, the boombox on his shoulder with the little cowboy hat on. <laughs> And it's kind of funny now because uh, he he being the boombox boy and now already uh, doing the uh, music movie music now all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's uh, in fact he I think he he would love to do the, the you know the theme music for the next Halloween. But yeah. We'll see. He he does have a number of uh, of musical pieces that he did in the new uh, 25 Years of Terror uh, DVD that uh, Anchor Bay put out. Yeah. And uh, I've been to his website just like I've been to your website, so it's, uh, it's all kind of neat. Uh, all kind of separates each other, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you been to Billy Warlock's website? I honestly, uh, to be honest, with you, I, I I looked up to a little information about your son Billy. I guess uh, on internetmoviedatabase.com, and uh, I guess he was a uh, part of the Baywatch series and all that. And uh, yeah, he yeah. was there the first two years. Okay. Yeah, I, I I'll be honest. I don't really know a whole lot about the whole Warlock family. I just. Uh, <laughs> How, you know, of course, uh, I'll mention, you know, Michael Strider to see uh, kind of how he get to you in the first place, but, uh, but uh, then I went to your website and emailed you, that's how, why we're doing the interview today. And uh, my, Michael Strider's a uh, dear friend. He's, he's a good guy. Yeah. I don't know how you, how you know him. Uh, uh, through the photography end of his life, or? Uh, uh, just uh, to his myspace.com page that I interviewed him a while back ago on the air, uh, and he's been helping me out ever since. So. Okay. So anyway, uh, back to you, uh, with, with all the things that you've done in your career, uh, are you ever going to write a book, or have you wrote a book? No, I haven't. I mean, I'm writing a book, but it's it's called My Life Story, okay. and it's uh, it's one that my wife gave me, and it's uh, empty pages. You know, it, it has a heading, uh, like high school years and uh, things like that, so I'm, I'm filling in all the blanks, but as far as writing a a book about my career, no, no, I, I had thought about it, uh, but no, I haven't done that. Okay, is that something that you might want to do later on in, in the future? No, or? I don't know, it's, uh, you know, I'm not real prolific when it comes to the written words, yeah. so I don't have to have a co-writer or a ghostwriter or whatever you want to call it, somebody oh, to help me out. Because I'm sure, you know, a lot of people, especially the, the big fans that know a lot about you, maybe not so much up here in the the north here, but uh, northern Minnesota, but, uh, you know, people who have followed your career for over, you know, ever since you first started doing films may be, you know, may want to know a lot about you, even if they already know a lot about you, you know what I mean? So you're in northern Minnesota? Yeah, we're in a, a town called Peep from the Falls, Minnesota. Are you, you near Bemidji? Yes. Very, we're only like uh, probably uh, two and a half hours away from the Well, room. there's another stunt guy that uh, used to be on uh, Kung Fu, and uh, uh, he lives up there in Bemidji. He only only bought a racetrack when he retired from the business. In, in fact, he may not be retired. Uh, his name is Greg Walker. Okay. So I don't look him up. I, he may even have a website. I might do that. He lives in Bemidji, and tell him that Dick Warlock said that he should do an interview with him. <laughs> Uh, now you know, like real close to where you live and whatnot. For anybody that uh, 
would ever want to be uh, in a film or, or be in a movie or learn how to be a stunt double, what type of advice would you give that person? Boy, oh boy, you, you covered, you know, uh, three I different territories here. I have to do stunt. Yeah. Uh, I guess there's still jobs out there, but with the with the CGI, you know, the computer graphics thing, they can take an actor's face and, and put it on any kind of motion that they want that actor to do, and, and they're doing it more and more every day. When they first, when this first came out, it was very expensive, so it was only in a few films. But now it's, it, you know, it's getting cheaper to do. So they uh, they really have cut a lot of stunt people out of work. Uh, but then again, I guess they hired a whole passel of people for the Caribbean movies, and uh, you know they're, they're working now on on the third one. They were shooting simultaneously number two and number three, but they hurried, hurried up and finished number two and got it out in the theaters. And now they're going to do the put the finishing touches on number three, and they used a, an awful lot of stunt guys on that. <laughs> uh, but as a rule, there's not as much work for stunt people as there used to be. Uh, but there's a lot of work as far as camera, uh, wardrobe, makeup, and all the other fields. And there's an awful lot of non-union productions going, so it's not as essential anymore that you belong to a union like it used to be. Although they prefer that you do because, uh, you know, the benefits of belonging to a union are much better than when you're without, I can guarantee you that. Uh, I, as far as acting, I don't know a lot about acting other than you need you need to be prepared when the door is open. I told that to my son Billy when he decided he wasn't gonna do stunts any longer. Yeah. He did stunts for about six months, you know. And he said, Dad, I think I'm gonna be an actor and I said, Well I don't know much about that but I can tell you one thing. When you get in the office it's a short walk from the front door to the back alley. So you better be ready when the opportunity presents itself. That's called luck. And he he studied, uh, not extensively because he's kind of a natural, yeah. you know. Uh, but he, he he studied the craft a little bit, and when the opportunity presented itself, he stepped up to the plate and uh, took off. And and he's been doing it since he was 18, and he's 45, so he's, he's had a pretty good career. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I guess I, I want to thank you. We're not really done yet, but I, I have one more thing for you to do. Of course, what I told you earlier in the show. Uh, but I want to thank you, first of all, for letting me, uh, for taking the time to let me interview you, first of all. And, uh, so it's been a real thrill. Thank you for asking. Yeah, a real, real thrill, real honor. And, uh, you know, if you have any uh, other way of getting people to want uh, to, or tell me about, or let people know a little bit about myself, that, hey, there's another guy that's uh, doing radio interviews. If you could ever help me out one time or whatever, that'd be, that'd be awesome. You know how to get in contact with me, so it's kind of... Sure. That'd be great. Uh, and uh, one last thing I want you to do, as I, I told you at the beginning of the interview, uh, I want you to give me a station ID. You bet. Ladies and gentlemen, we're listening to Frankie Slasson Show on Pioneer 90.1. Stay tuned for a commercial. We'll be right back. Thank you. All right. And we will be right back right after these messages. And uh, once again, thank you very much, Dick. You're welcome.